So let me quickly start with introducing our speaker. Um, so Thomas Hagen uh, is a professor of mathematics at the University of uh, Memphis currently. Uh, before joining at the University of Memphis in 2003, uh, he had academic appointments at the University of Wales, uh, UK, and the Technical University of Munich, Germany. He was born and grew up in Western Germany, began his academic career in Munich uh, with a major in mathematics and a minor in computer science. Uh, and he received a master's degree in applied mathematics from the University of uh, Texas at Dallas in 1995. And he got his PhD from Virginia Tech. Uh, in parentheses, there's a big control group in Virginia Tech, just, just so you know, uh, in 1998. So his research interests lie in applied analysis, especially partial uh, differential equations, dynamical systems and fluid mechanics. And, and he used to be a Fulbright scholar and the recipient of uh, several uh, research and teaching awards. Uh, he's married and has a daughter in elementary school. So I am pretty happy to have Dr. Hagen uh, to give us a talk. Uh, his talk is going to be on uh, fluid dynamics of Betelgeuse, a mathematical scavenger hunt. So, <laughs> stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Oz, for, for, for having me. And I want to thank also Emma and Ahmed. I met both of you before at conference. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's nice to close the semester, I think, with, you know, a, a lecture that is between, I hope, entertainment and actual mathematics. And it's not going to include any PDEs, I have to add. So um, <laughs> this, is, this is something I'm, I, I've, I've done for several years. I got interested in that more than 10 years ago when I listened to a talk that Paul Steen from Cornell gave at the um, at, at the University of Minnesota. And a few years later, I, I, I got involved in the research side of that topic and, and worked with him. And we, we, we published a really nice paper, I think, two years ago on this topic. And we, we plan to continue working in this area. And then unfortunately, Paul passed away in 2020, completely unexpectedly, not related to COVID or anything like that. And that put mm -hmm. kind of a stop to our ambitious goals, but still it's, it's a really beautiful topic in my opinion for an applied mathematician. So let me start with this here. Um, so what I want to talk about is fluid dynamics of people choose a mathematical scavenger hunt. So again, thanks for having me. Um, and as I said, this is joint work with Paul Steen from Cornell. So what am I going to talk about? Well, the topic is rooted in what is known as biomimicry or biomimetics. And what this is, it's the emulation of the model systems and elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems. That's the definition that's online on Wikipedia as of a few weeks ago. And so what is actually happening? So there is a well-known study that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences out in over 20 years now old, due to Eisner and Anes Hansley. And they studied Hemispherota cyanea. And Hemispherota cyanea, if you look at this picture, is this little beetle here, this purplish black beetle, which is being attacked by ants. And a whole swarm of ants is going for this beetle tries to turn it over, tries to kill it, you know, and, and, and take it off to, to wherever they want to take it off. But the beetle defends itself. And it has a very interesting defense mechanism, namely it sucks itself to the ground and so strongly that the whole swarm of ants is unable to lift it. And what's interesting is to look at the footprint of this beetle. If you look here in this picture C, this is the footprint of the beetle when it's not being attacked. And in picture D, this is the footprint when it is being attacked. And so that already is a hint of what's happening. What's this defense mechanism this beetle has? 
And so what is it? When you look at the underside of the beetle, it has these feet. They are called tarsi. And they end in little microchannels. And these mi little microchannels, he can pump liquid, oily liquid out. So what he does when, when, when being attacked is he sucks itself to the ground by pumping oily liquid out of the endings of his feet, these tarsi. And they form liquid bridges with the, with the underground, the substrate. And these liquid bridges are very hard to break. And in fact, people have studied, uh, I mean, how, how, how strong is this adhesion? And here you see the little beetle in this picture A, all of that taken, by the way, from this, this uh, um, PNAS paper, where they attach a weight to the little beetle. And, and I mean, this is almost a brutal picture, but he can withstand, or it can withstand 60 times its, its um, body weight um, this way. And that's how it defends against ants. By the way, I should say that, let me go back here for a second. Um, there is another predator to this beetle, namely, I think this is called a wheel bug. And the wheel bug, I mean, brutal as it is nature, the wheel bug tries to find an opening on the beetle, and then he harpoons the beetle. And the, 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 the beetle doesn't survive that, and then the wheel bug can suck out whatever is in the beetle um, in Hemispherota cyanea. So this is an attack the beetle cannot survive. So what is important is, so it's these liquid bridges that come out of there. And uh, you see how this goes. Here you have um, these, these micro channels ending in these little fluid droplets. These fluid droplets will form the liquid bridges with the substrate. And um, it gives this typical footprint. Here. Very important here is surface tension, because without the surface tension, you would not have these droplets forming. And biomimicry means simply that you look at this adhesion mechanism that people has, and you try to use this to solve complex problems of nature, uh, of, 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 of humankind. And that's what people have actually done, in particular Paul Steen and his group. They built a so-called electroosmotic droplet switch that was exactly doing what the people was doing. And I got interested in this topic because when you try to understand the fluid dynamics of how is the liquid moving in these channels, how do these droplets form, etc., there are some really fascinating phenomena happening. And the most important one of them is known as volume scavenging. So what you see here on the right hand side, this is supposed to um, mimic what, what, the uh, what the channel endings on this people are doing. Namely, you have liquid droplets forming on top of, this is a plexiglass, so they have tiny little holes, half a millimeter in diameter holes, drilled in plexiglass. Underneath is a reservoir filled with, with liquid, and the liquid is coming out. And all the droplets are more or less the same shape, more or less the same size. And they are connected underneath to this liquid reservoir. And then you let this sit there, this plexiglass with the droplets, and then a very interesting phenomenon happens. Namely, suddenly some of these droplets start to grow in size at the expense of others. Others shrink, few of them become larger. And this goes so far that in the end, very few droplets are left that are very large and all the others are pretty much depleted until in the end you have only one large droplet left. Everything else is gone. And this is called volume scavenging. And this is a process we set out to model in a general context. And I mean, the modeling was done by Paul's group primarily. Um, but, but, but the mathematical analysis, why this is happening, how it's happening, this is what I'm going to talk about. And here's a schematic if we have only two droplets. So don't get confused here. Here, all the droplets are next to each other. But of course, ignoring gravity and other factors, you can just assume that you have one channel that has two openings, one droplet is large, the other one on the bottom is small here. And we try to model the dynamics of what's happening here. So the first thing is trying to understand a two droplet network. So how do we model this? How is it done? Let's focus on one droplet. So this is a spherical cap. This is pretty a pretty good approximation to what's actually happening. The spherical cap, you have a fixed radius where the, where the droplet comes out from. So underneath here would be this channel. 
And it's a spherical cap geometry, meaning this is a partial uh, drop. It has a radius, the, the center point of the droplet of this spherical droplet is moving, depending on you know how much liquid is there. So we need surface tension. I said this is important. It's non-dimensionalized to one. The channel radius is non-dimensionalized to one. We have a channel length underneath. The channel is here not depicted. It has non-dimensionalized length L. We have a variable droplet radius. This is this quantity here, depending on how big the droplet is. Similarly, we have droplet height. This is measured, of course, differently. Okay. And we have a variable droplet volume. So all these last three variable quantities are, of course, related to each other through the spherical cap geometry. In fact, it's a very nice exercise that I sometimes give to, uh, well, I haven't done it in a while, but, but for calculus students, they can work this out. What is the relationship between radius, height, and volume in such a spherical cap geometry? So you get that twice the radius of this spherical cap is the height of it plus one over the, uh, the height. And the volume in this non-dimensional setting is a fourth the height times h squared plus three. So very simple relations, which are essentially based on elementary trigonometry, um, describe already how these droplets um, are shaped. How does the surface tension come into the game? It comes through the pressure due to surface tension. Namely, we use here the young Laplace law for a spherical cap that says the pressure imposed on, the, on this droplet is two divided by the radius of the droplet. And then when we plug in what is the radius in terms of the height, we get a relationship for the pressure due to surface tension, the Laplace pressure, uh, in terms of the height of uh, the spherical cap drop. Now, as it turns out, it's useful to write the pressure here also not only in terms of height, but also in terms of volume. There is this relationship down here that relates height with volume. One can do that. It looks at first intimidating when one does that. So the pressure is not written as a function of height, but it's written now as a function of volume. You get an expression that looks like this. It turns out it is easier to work with this form, even though the expression is um, look, looks nasty. So, and now let's take a look. How does this pressure function look like, depending on the volume? So, if you increase the volume from zero, then the pressure goes up. It goes through a maximum due to the normal normalization I have here. The maximum is at two, and it's taken on when the volume is one. And after that, the pressure declines. And this is quite amazing because when you do, for instance, uh, in comparison, the two balloon experiment, you have maybe seen that one before that you have two air balloons and you connect them with each other through a, through a little pipe. And let's say one balloon is bigger than the other one. You have one that is small and the other one is big. And um, you initially, you, you restrict the airflow through the tube and then you lift this restriction. What do you think is going to happen? Will the small balloon become larger or will the small balloon pump the remaining air into the, into, the, into the larger balloon. So will it become smaller? Now, most people would assume, okay, what is going to happen is that the air from the large balloon will flow into the small balloon. But it turns out this is not always the case. In fact, what happens is that, it, that, that the small balloon depletes even more under certain circumstances. And this is the two balloon experiment. And the reason is exactly that one here, that the pressure is not monotone as a function of volume. It's only initially monotonely increasing, and then it's monotonically decreasing, and it decays to zero. And by the way, I have also indicated here what this means for the height of the, of the spherical cap. It's aligned with volume here. So due to the non-dimensionalization, volume one means that the height of the balloon is uh, of, of the droplet is one. 
And uh, less than one always means that the um, droplet is subhemispherical and we call that small. And height larger than one means that the droplet is superhemispherical and we call it large. Now we have to model the dynamics. How is that going to work? And we use a very simple um, idea there, namely that we propose that the volumetric flow rate, how much fluid is flowing, is a function of the pressure gradient. In particular, for standard Newtonian pipe flow, that means um, that the fluid behaves like, let's say, water, or it behaves like uh, a Newtonian liquid, like many oils or so, that the volumetric flow rate is proportional to the pressure gradient that is um, acting in the droplet. You can generalize that for power law fluids. We have done that. It has some interesting features. I'll show you later that. So these are fluids that are uh, not having this linear relationship, but be, uh, the, the volumetric flow rate is proportional to a power of the pressure gradient. And when we do that, uh, we can write down dynamical equations for the two droplet regime, namely that the uh, rate of change of volume in droplet one, let's say one is droplet one, the other one is droplet two, probably I'm pointing to the wrong ones now, um, um, is a proportion or is given uh, via the pressure gradient. And what's the pressure gradient? It's simply the difference between the pressures that uh, dominate in the droplets. So the rate of change in volume one, so the volumetric flow rate, that's, that's this one here, in volume one, is given by uh, the difference between the pressure that is in volume two minus the pressure that's in volume one. So if the pressure in volume two is higher than the pressure in volume one, uh, then liquid is pumped into volume one, into droplet one, and it will increase. That's what this says. And for the volumetric flow rate uh, governing the, the second droplet, it's the same thing, just the opposite pressure relation. As I said, you can generalize that for a power law. Um, and then you take uh, exactly the same law uh, you have to take it to a power S. There are fluids that behave like this. There are actually many. And, and for this, for this people, for instance, this is an oily liquid. And you know, many biological liquids are not quite Newtonian. So it is conceivable that there you would have a power law dominating instead of a Newtonian pipe flow. I will primarily concentrate on the Newtonian model here uh, because the results are not vastly different. There are some interesting aspects arising when you do power law liquids, but um, for, for simplicity, let me stay with the Newtonian model. And then we have to understand, okay, I mean, this is not a two droplet model for the, for the, for the people because it has in the order of 10 to five to 10 to six um, channel openings. So there are 10 to 5 to 10 to 6 droplets involved. So they are somehow connected via a network, and we try to model that. So in order to go to an end droplet model, then we need to model the channel network. And we do that by, by using adjacency matrices. And adjacency matrices are such that uh, you, you, you know, here's the example for n equals 5. You take a 5 by 5 matrix. And when you have a connection between um, one droplet and another droplet, you, you, you have here position one, two. There's a connection between droplet one and two. So you put a one in position one, two. And since there's also a connection, of course, then for symmetry reasons between two and one, you put also a one here in position two, one. And you do that in general, and you can model a linear network or you can model a star network. You can model a complete network where every uh, um, droplet is connected with every other droplet via a channel, or you can do rings. And in each case, you get a different adjacency matrix. And so using that, we can write down the governing equations when we have n droplets. So this just generalizes the two droplet case. So the volumetric flow rate in droplet J is given by the uh, sum total of pressure differences that uh, contribute, or the net total of pressure differences. And in order to model that, we have here 
um, channels connecting and some channels are not connected, or some droplets are not connected, we use an abated adjacency matrix. So that's like an adjacency matrix, except that we allow uh, the entries to be different from one. Um, and how big should we pick them if there's a connection between any two droplets? Well, we pick this inversely proportional to the length of the channel connecting droplet I and J. And the reason is the underlying fluid model, namely the Poiseuille law uh, for Newtonian pipe flow would, would, would tell us exactly that. And so this is our model. We, we connect um, the different droplets depending on what, what network we are on. And we have here these pressure gradients. And there are N droplets, capital N droplets. So this will be an ODE system consisting of N first order ODEs. And now the first thing that we can say about such a problem, and I do a little bit of math before I show you uh, simulation is, uh, mass is always conserved in such a, or volume is always conserved in such a problem because start out with some initial conditions for the volumes, then that's the sum of these volumes stays always the same. And this is a simple consequence of the model. Um, it always comes out of that. So in other words, we can use the average droplet volume, V bar, the average. This is an invariant of the system. It always stays the same. And for us, we always assume that the average droplet volume is always positive. So we don't want cavitation events where you know fluid is sucked inside the channel. We only want fluids extruding from these, from these microchannels. That's what the idea is. So now let's try to give at least some basic understanding of how volume scavenging works, at least in the two droplet case. So how does this work? So we have uh, our average droplet volume and I assume here for simplicity, this is larger than one. So say I take volume one, that's the droplet one, it has volume V1 and we take the average volume and add a small quantity. Then we have to subtract the same quantity in the other droplet volume. What happens from the graph is then, since V bar is larger than one, keep in mind that's where we are decreasing. That means since volume V1 is larger, the pressure in droplet one is smaller than the pressure in droplet two. And so what happens is even though volume two is already smaller, since the pressure in there is larger, even more volume is pushed out from droplet two into droplet one. And so droplet one will increase in size. It keeps on doing that, depleting volume two until some kind of equilibrium arises. And now what I'm going to show you is some animations for volume scavenging. Um, we take a population size here of n equals 25. And when I say um, population, I mean, of course, fluid droplets. We take a linear array. Um, we always assume that the channel length is one. So that means um, we have really a standard adjacency matrix. It's the Newtonian flow. So the power law applies with S equals one. So it's the one that I've been talking to. And you will see, see three simulations. The one on the top will have the largest average droplet volume, namely 1.4, in the middle 1.2, and at the bottom 1.05. And I let the simulation run with staggered initial conditions. What is a staggered, uh, what, what are staggered initial conditions? Well, what we do is we take the initial conditions for each volume to be V bar, and then we add or subtract a small amount. How do we do that? For the first droplet, we subtract the largest amount, which is still small. For the second droplet, we take a slightly larger one. So we step up for the third one, slightly larger, all the way until we get to the middle one, which is droplet 13, where we have for droplet 13, we take just the average droplet volume as initial condition. And then from 14 to 25 on, we increase again by this small incremental amount. So the largest starting volume is in droplet 25. And the smallest starting volume is in droplet one. 
trick question. What do you think which droplet is going to win? If you think there might be a winner. Well, I would say 25 because the bigger one is the bigger right. But of course, you, 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 would, you would say, yes, that's exactly what I would say. I mean, everybody would say, okay, number 25. So let's take a look. By the way, the color coding, this is a little bit complicated. When you see red, it means the droplet is losing volume. Blue means it's gaining volume. Aqua means there's a flow to the right, orange flow to the left, and yellow, the droplet is out of the competition. With other words, it's already a loser. And when you see black, uh, there is negligible change, nothing happens anymore. So let's take a look. So I have to get out of here now for a second and, and, and go to the, the movie I have. Okay, let me see how I do this. Stop share, I guess. And then share my other thing. Okay. So I hope you can see this now. So here, this is average droplet volume is 1.4 on top. In the middle, this is average droplet volume is 1.2. And at the bottom, average droplet volume is um, 1.05. And this started already a few seconds ago before this recording started. But let me show you what happens. Red means losing, blue means gaining in volume. So I stop here for a second. So what you see on the top is the yellow droplets here are already losers, meaning they cannot win anymore. And there's a reason why they cannot win anymore. In particular, droplet 25 is a loser. The blue ones, they are still gaining in volume. The red ones are losing in volume. In the second picture, the situation is similar, um, except that there seem to be more winners right now and only one loser in red and all the yellow stuff they already lost. They're out of the competition. And in the last picture, you don't see any change much happening because the average volume was so low that the pressures are too small to push something very fast through the network. So things start to happen from the outside and then they move inside. But we, we, we track this further. So let me see what happens then. OK. On the top, we have only one that is still gaining. On the, in the middle, only one is gaining. And now in the, in the bottom, also only one is gaining. And the top is decided. The middle is decided. And now the, the, the the end is also kind of decided, and here the movie stops. Oops, okay, so I can show this again, but you have seen it. So, what happens even though there are droplets that start out with more volume? They're not the winners. Okay, but what you also see is it appears there's always one winner. Okay, and so the question is. Why is this happening? And does this always happen? So let's see, I stop sharing here again and go back to my talk. So first of all, notice in all these cases, the droplet volume was larger than one, the average volume. If you look at the situation, what happens when the volume is between zero and one, the situation is much more complicated. And it turns out there you have situations arising where you don't get a single winner. In fact, it can happen there that all droplets in the end have the same volume. So something special is happening when the volume crosses the value one. This is the first observation. And then you can do other simulations here, and I show you that. What you see here is um, a plot. You take the average droplet volume changing between 1 and 2.5 and the number of droplets in the competition. So what you just saw was 25, but you can do it, of course, for less than that. And then each time you have a winning droplet if you run this. And uh, the winning droplet would be 25 it's, if it's very large, uh, very, very dark, the picture. And it would be very faint, uh, almost white, if the winning droplet is number one. And focus just on the case S equals 1, because this is the Newtonian case I've been showing you. 
So initially, it seems this is a very stable situation that kind of always the same droplet wins or the same position droplet somewhere in the middle, maybe. But then at some point, there is a radical change. We go from a low number droplet to a high number droplet. See this dark coloring here? And, and this is very bizarre. What this indicates is that the underlying dynamics, the basin of attraction, is very complicated here for these type of flows. Here you have a couple of pictures for shear thinning fluids. That's, that's these power law fluids. So in general, it appears that more shear thinning has a, a, an effect on the, on the flow that kind of, kind of makes it look more smooth. Less shear thinning, you have still these abrupt changes like what you saw in the Newtonian case. So all that should tell you that in general, it is very, very difficult to predict which droplet is going to be the winner. And this is now only done here for the linear network. Can you imagine how difficult it will be when you have other networks? So very difficult to predict which droplet will be the winner. But we can do a little bit of analysis here. So this, these were our governing equations. And it turns out that we have a Lyapunov functional available. What we do is we use the pressure volume work functional. So we integrate the pressure function over the volumes and so on and sum over them. And this is a nice functional because it's closely related to the total surface area of the droplets. In fact, this is nothing else but surface area up to a constant multiple. And so we have a simple proposition. This functional is always non-negative and it blows up when the inputs blow up, so when the volumes blow up. And we can say even more, it is a Lyapunov function because when you look at the solution and you work out the derivative of this function along the solution, you get something that's always negative at most zero, namely an expression like this. This can be done quite explicitly. It's a very simple calculation. And so what this means is this derivative is always less than equal to zero. And the only way that it happens to be zero is if you are hitting an equilibrium. And this is here somewhat strangely formulated because when you look at the situation for uh, power law fluids, you have non-uniqueness of solutions, which means that you, you can have a non-constant, non-equilibrium solution that ends up in an equilibrium at finite time. So that's why this is formulated here in uh, somewhat yeah, unusual terms. In order to have an equilibrium, what comes out of it, essentially these terms here have to vanish. So the pressure in droplet I must be the same as the pressure in droplet J. So, and this is the criterion that tells us when do we have an equilibrium solution, a stationary solution. And the other thing you get out of this Lyapunov function immediately is that solutions exist for all time and are always unique. When S is one or larger, turns out they are not unique when S is less than one. So when the power law index is less than one, and that's what you call a sheer thickening fluid, um, uh, solutions are not unique. So then we have some forward invariant sets. The first one is, of course, the one of mass volume conservation. So um, forward invariant simply means if your initial conditions are picked to start in this set, then the solution will always stay in this set for all positive times. And the first one is simply mass conservation, because if we start in the set where we have constant, initially a given average droplet volume, we already know we are going to preserve this average drop, droplet volume. So this is the first one. But there's a second one. And the second one is if I look at the same set of constant mass and look at initial conditions that are always positive or non-negative, that's why I take here the closure. Okay. Then this simply means that if you start out with non-negative volumes, droplet volumes remain non-negative. So there are no cavitation events happening. And the third one is the most interesting one, forward invariant set. And that's the following. Look at that. So you start out with droplet volumes. You have a given V bar, a, give, a given average droplet volume. And all the droplets have positive or non-negative volume to begin with. Look at the kth volume. If the kth volume is less than equal to one, 
then this is forward invariant. That means it stays less than equal to one. So if your average droplet volume was larger than one to begin with, you know that a droplet that has dropped to one or below will never be able to recover. It will stay less than equal to one for all eternity. And it's actually not entirely trivial to prove the last thing. It, I'm not saying it's extremely difficult, but this is the one where you have to work hardest to show. And so we, we dubbed this, the situation once down and out, always down and out. So droplet volumes that fall below one will never recover. That's what this means. And as I said before, as a reminder, I call a droplet large when its volume or height satisfies V larger than one or height is larger than one and small if the volume is less than equal to one and height is less than equal to one. And this is largely motivated by this once down and out, always down and out situation. So you can basically, if for, um, when you determine a winner, you can already ignore all the droplets that have fallen below one. So this initial value problem for this given system defines a semi-flow on, on the set of uh, mass conserved uh, flows there. And this is a gradient dynamical system with the Yapuno function W. And since this is the case, you already know a couple of things. Namely, the one thing you know that the semi-flow has a global attractor and the global attractor consists entirely of equilibrium solutions. So every semi-trajectory semi of the system that starts um, with, with uh, given average droplet volume converges to an equilibrium as t goes to infinity. And equilibria, they all are such that uh, each droplet has positive volume that we know as well. So, um, Volume conservation has another consequence, and this is something now quite elementary, but it turns out it's the hardest part in everything I've, I've done here. Um, any equilibrium always will consist of n large droplets and capital N minus little n small droplets. Why is that? I told you an equilibrium means the pressure in each droplet must be the same. When you think back of how the, how the uh, pressure behaved, I showed you the picture here. You can have the same pressure in exactly two cases. Namely, a droplet is large, meaning its volume is large. And at the same time, you have the same pressure for a volume that is small. And so that gives now many, many possibilities when you can see um, equal pressure. And all these possibilities give rise to different equilibrium solutions. So one equilibrium solution that you always have is the one where each um, droplet has the same height, same volume, it's uniform across the board. And you have this always. And volume conservation tells you now more. If you sum over the volume of all the large droplets, so they all must have the same height, and you add to it the volume of the droplets that are small, and the nice thing is, if you think back, when can you have the same pressure? The pressure was two over R. R was H plus one over H. That means if I have an H that gives me a certain pressure, then one over H will give me the same pressure as well. But one over H, if H is larger than one, one over H will be less than one. So large volumes go with H. Small volumes go with H inverse or one over H. So the sum total gives me the volumes of all the large droplets plus all the small droplets. And that has to be altogether the total volume. So I have this simple equation. Now the volume was a third order polynomial, third degree polynomial in H. And so, sorry for that. Okay. So what happens is, therefore, that I can find non-uniform equilibria by simply looking for solution H larger than one of this equation. But this equation here is not nice because it's rational and it's much nicer to uh, turn it into a polynomial. Why is it rational? Because if I replace here H by one over H, then this is 
uh, one over h cubed or something like this here. Okay, so you multiply two by h cubed and you get a polynomial of degree six, and it's written here. This is my p alpha h. And then you do the usual thing. You, you divide through by capital N and N divided by capital N, you call alpha and you get a polynomial of degree six like this. And now your job is find all the zeros H larger than one corresponding to large droplets of this mass polynomial. where alpha is a number between zero and one. And at that moment you say, okay, polynomial degree six, I don't see an easy factorization here. What do you do? And basically this is where you give up. And I don't know what techniques there are. I found a zero only by accident, I have to add. I could factor this polynomial by accident. In fact, I was trying for a long, long time if I could find zeros larger than one of this polynomial. And finally I succeeded because it turns out, and, and let me add this here. There are two parameters in this polynomial, the alpha and the v-bar. And you just so happen to find a zero of this polynomial when v-bar is a special quantity, namely this quantity here in red. Then you can completely factor the polynomial um, and you can use that to determine when has the polynomial zeros larger than one. And there are three cases to be distinguished. When the volume is larger than one and alpha is between zero and one, you have one zero larger than one, it's this one. When V is exactly one, alpha has to be between zero and one half. Otherwise you don't get a zero larger than one. But if alpha is between zero and one half, you get the same zero again as before and it will be larger than one. And in the final case, when the volume is less than one and alpha is between zero and a half, plus in addition, V bar is at least this red quantity, then you get two zeros larger than one. One being larger than this quantity, one over alpha minus one to the power one fourth and the other one smaller. And they happen to agree exactly when V bar is this limiting quantity. So this already highlights, you will develop one large droplet um, only when you have the case V bar larger than one. And in the case that V bar is less than one, you have the choice that there might be two different types of large droplets. Okay, now that we know that, uh, we can make up, up equilibrium solutions consisting of little n large droplets and capital uh, N minus little n small droplets. And then the question is, what can we say about stability of these equilibrium solutions? I mean, it's fairly certain to speculate when the volume is larger than one, since we saw only one winner always, it suggests that as an equi equilibrium consisting of exactly one large droplet and everything else small would be a winning one, meaning a stable equilibrium. And so the, the idea to approach this here is not using linearization techniques, but instead to use um, local minimizers of the Lyapunov function. And in order to find local minimizers of the Lyapunov function, we can use a Lagrangian involving one multiplier, that's this little lambda here, um, multiplying the mass constraint, right? I mean, I need to, I need to maxim, uh, find, find, find a maximum or minimum or, 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 or minimizer of this Lyapunov function under the condition that the average volume doesn't change. And uh, it turns out this is the, the correct approach, especially in the case when I'm not in the Newtonian situation, because in the non-Newtonian situation, equilibria are non-hyperbolic and then linearization approaches completely fail. Um, and when one, one does this systematically, one gets necessary and sufficient conditions for constraint optimizations. And what do they show is that an equilibrium is unstable if it contains at least two large droplets under any certain circumstances. So two or more large droplets means always unstable. This cannot be, um, this, this cannot be a, a end result. An equilibrium with volume larger than one is stable if and only if it contains exactly one large droplet. That's what our simulation showed. That's the only stable situation. If you 
kick out this constraint b bar larger than one, then you get an equilibrium with one large droplet is stable if and only if the large droplet is sufficiently large. In that case, meaning it has to be of the size n minus one to the one four. And that assumes again that I have capital N droplets. So that means that's the height it must have. If it doesn't have that, and there is a situation where it doesn't arise, you saw that here I showed you uh, when you plug in alpha equals one over capital N, you get exactly to this capital N minus one to the one four. And there are solutions with large droplets that do not satisfy this condition I just formulated here for stability. So um, if that happens, you're still stable, even when the volume is less than one. And finally, the uniform equilibrium, meaning that all the droplets have the same size. This is a stable configuration or a stable equilibrium if and only if the volume is between zero and one. So all the droplets are the same size and they are small because each of them has average droplet volume. Um, it includes the case V bar equal to one only in the case of the two droplet regime. Okay, this is kind of the outlier. Here. And so this gives a complete classification of what are the stable equilibria. And now what one would like to do is one would like to get some kind of bifurcation picture and, 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 and you know, see when is something stable, when is something unstable. And this is kind of the last thing I want to do here is that I introduce a new um, bifurcation quantity here, namely theta of H, which I let be the volume of large droplets minus the volume of small droplets or vice versa. And then I can write conservation of volume that I just showed you in terms of this quantity theta instead of the quantity H or, or something else. And it takes on the form of this equation involving this function V theta here. And then what I do is we plot V bar, that average droplet volume, against the parameter theta. So in other words, we simply solve this equation numerically here where I prescribe what is V bar. And, and what solves this? What theta solves this? And in the two droplet case, what happens is initially the only solutions are two droplets of the same size, both of them small, until we hit droplet volume is one. And then what we see is another solution is here the droplets both still have same size and are large, because now that average volume is larger than one, but we know already two large droplets cannot be stable. So this is an unstable equilibrium. Instead, what emerges is a solution where you have one large droplet and one small one. And this is indicated here by this capital L1 and capital S1. When you have three do droplets, the situation gets a bit worse. Initially, only stable is the uniform equilibrium. All droplets are of the same size and they are small until you hit average volume one. Then these three equal sized volumes are large volumes, and this becomes unstable because you cannot have three large, large droplets in an, in, as a stable equilibrium. Instead, what emerges is here that you have a second solution consisting of one large droplet and two small ones. And this is the stable one. But there is another one consisting of one large droplet and two small ones, but the large droplet is not large enough to be stable. So this is also unstable here until the large droplet is large enough and then it takes over. And down here you have an equilibrium solution where you have two large droplets and one small one, and it's also unstable. And the general picture looks something like this. Now don't get intimidated, this is just uh, generalizing what happens here. And um, the interesting thing is if you have n large droplets, and I have plot here only the odd case, the even case looks similar, except that you have one more symmetric branch showing up in the end, that we know exactly when these bifurcations happen. And they are given in terms of this limiting function that showed up before when I told you about solutions of the, the mass polynomial. This is where this function kicks in. We have a so-called bistability range. Bistability range simply means you have two stable solutions existing at the same time. And that happens here between L of one over N all the way up to one. 
what are the two stable solutions that exist at the same time here? Well, it's here, this uniform equilibrium. And up here, you see that the equilibrium, and this keeps on going, of course, of one large droplet and n minus one small droplets. So these are two stable solutions that exist at the same time. You didn't see that in the numerics because the, the computation showed you only what happens for volumes larger than one. This was a new finding at the time that such equilibrium solutions exist in the system. They have not been observed in nature. Uh, people haven't really looked for them either. But, but with these volume scavenging experiments, they didn't show up. Thomas, you have two minutes. OK, I will be done in two <laughs> minutes, because now I will, sorry for that, uh, make one little uh, outside comment here. And that's the winner takes all system. In sociology and socioeconomics, you have so-called winner take all societies that show such a concentration phenomenon where you have a disproportionately large reward uh, that falls to one or a few winners, even though all competitors start out with comparable resources like these droplets, they emerge one winner when the volume is large. So you have that in professional sports, entertainment industry, and so on. And how does a population of droplets behave? Well, it does exactly the same thing. They behave just like regular folks. So you can match your droplets to individu individuals competing, fluid volume to the res resource of the competition, the network, that determines the level and efficiency of the individuals interacting. The fluid rheology, that's trading friction, or trading friction or inefficiency of resource exchange, and the governing equations, the rules of the competition. And then when you look at the picture, what is possible for the droplet situation? When the volume is larger than one, you get the winner take all outcome. When the droplet volume is in the bi-stable range, you get either the egalitarian outcome that corresponds to the uniform equilibrium, everybody gets the same thing, or you get winner take all. And if the droplet volume is sufficiently small, you get only the egalitarian outcome, meaning the uniform equilibrium. And now the situation gets quite interesting because you might ask, what is best for a population macroeconomically? The answer is, well, you obviously want to maximize the, the total resource thinking if society produces a lot, we buy is very large, then there is a lot for each individual. But now let's ask the question on microeconomics, what's best for the individual? Well, it turns out when you plot your large volume, average volume against what a non-winning droplet, sorry for that, wins, you increase the, the total resource available to, to this population of droplets, individuals get less and less. And this is shocking because it shouldn't be that way. Right? But this is exactly what we observe in this particular population. With this, thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. What a very good talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we will be taking the questions. Uh, you might use the reactions, chat, or since we have a long number of people, we might just speak up for questions. So any questions for Dr. Eger? I have one question for the balloon thing. Um, yeah. So you had like 25 balloons, you know, just lined up already. So is there any like control theory related approaches like you put like valves in between those balloons so you can actually control the flow so when the when the droplet starts getting the volume less than one you sort of like prevent that happening yeah uh, that that was actually one of the goals we had originally mm -hmm. because we are only tackling here the basic dynamics in these fluids what what i wanted to do afterwards with paul was you know one of the aspects was to do control how to approach this because mm -hmm. i mean um, they built this device, and I actually have a movie here I didn't show you, but, but I, I could show you how this device looks like. If you want to see it's a one-minute movie, I can, I can pull it up, but only if, if people want to see it, you know. Um, so You can share um, that in the meantime as you speak. Let, let, let me see if I can put this on here real quick, then, then I can possibly show you. Okay, how do I get out of here? Because I was reading on Wikipedia, you know, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, so, you know, it says like the patients were started 
you know, sharing the ventilators, but because of the lung capacities of different people, like, like older versus young, whatever, you have different elasticity. So this well, caused like, you know, always the oxygen going into the bigger one, better one. Yeah, so they, they stop doing that. that. That they ha there have been studies for that exactly for building artificial lungs and in, in mm -hmm. ventilation devices. And that was actually done something like 10, 15 years ago. But this came kind of to an end because um, I'm not sure it came to an end. But what I saw is that nobody seems to have followed up really on these things. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you talk about balloons then, or, or inflation devices, Mm -hmm. then then you don't have surface tension you know holding holding everything in in place it's a much more complicated elastic membrane uh, that has has uh, possibly several inflection points and stuff like this so it's not just a pressure profile that's monotonically increasing monotonically decreasing it's much more complicated with several maxima and minima could and, be hysteretic too right could be hysteretic yeah. too yeah, hysteretic exactly, and and that there could be there could be all kinds of situations arising, and that's one of the projects I'm I'm still working on myself these days to go away from more, you know surface tension and to have much more com complicated pressure uh, volume uh, response functions, and and it gets very quickly very complicated then, very complicated, so. Let me let me quickly share with you what I have here, if I if I may. Okay, let's see where do I put. I need to open this. There, we go. there are graduate students, by the way, here. They may ask you questions about the graduate programs in general or your experience sure. in academia and stuff. So after maybe you're done. So let me show you this. So what you see here is they build a prototype uh, mimicking what what the beetle is doing. So what you have here is. This is this little plexiglass device that is filled underneath with a reservoir of liquid, and they can impose um, voltage. This is all uh, Paul Steen's lab. I have nothing to do with this. Okay, mm -hmm. so and 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 uh, put a pressure volt. That's this electroosmotic switch, and see what happens. So you will see if the voltage comes on up here. Now they gave the mm -hmm. impulse, and it's hanging. There's now no no. no no electricity flowing now. Okay, so it's just just this this these little liquid bridges that they have caused there to come out, and they put weights on there. So it's exactly the principle that these these people is using, and and the fluid dynamics is what I described to you. Of course, I never touched upon the liquid bridges, but on the droplet formation, and that is uncontrolled. What I'm doing, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see. So you can't really control it. Oh. Well, you don't have to control if you have the large volume. Okay. So the liquid bridges are there and you're good. I see. I see. I know. Yeah. This, this really self explains. <laughs> so, and in the end, since it doesn't break, they give an impulse, I think, again. Yeah. They, they, they get to make it break. <laughs> So, so that was that was this little demonstration. So they prototyped this stuff, okay, like and that. they got patents for it and all kinds of stuff. And I think they even sent it up into to the space station. Oh, who knows what? Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. I mean, are there any other questions? Do you have a question? It, it was actually a great presentation, my guy. I'm just sad that I failed to predict the result. And, uh, In the beginning, right? <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was wrong. I said that. So do we have any other questions before we close up? Any other question from anyone else? Any graduate students? Um, Thomas, do you have PhD students as well right now? You do, right? I do have one PhD student right now, but we are not working on this. So we are working on, 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 a, on a different project um, that has to do with film forming flows. Okay. So this is um, in my department, I'm one of the more applied mathematicians, I want mm -hmm. to say. 
Mm -hmm. Even though I do teach right now the real variables class, the hard mm -hmm. analysis class. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what if our students want to apply to your graduate program? Like, what, what would you say about that? Um, we might be a Carnegie R1 university. <laughs> probably it's fall on or from December on. So it comes out in, in probably two weeks. I don't know what this means really, mm -hmm. because we haven't really changed this much. But mm -hmm. um, I think we have a quite decent program in, in mathematics, in applied mathematics. Uh, it's very analysis oriented. So a lot of differential equation stuff. Uh, we do have some data science. We do have uh, statistics a lot as well. So if people are interested in that, this is uh, a good program to go to for that. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, we are doing classical applied analysis a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, I think, one of our strengths in the department, I would say. Thanks. Any other questions, suggestions in general? If there are any questions, please follow up with me. I, I, you can always reach me. Uh, Dr. Oz, I think you, 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 you made my email address available or something like mm -hmm. this. So please feel free to contact me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the master's program coordinator here. Not that you need to come to us because you have your own master's program. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but feel free to reach out to Smile. me if there's something you know, about the PhD program or something you would be interested in. More than happy to either help you directly or put you in contact, contact with the people that can help you. All right, awesome talk. So what I'm gonna do next is uh, just letting you know that I'm gonna edit this talk a little bit in the beginning, at the end, you know, and I'm gonna make it available on the YouTube channel as well as in our webpage so that, so that you can share with your students, future students, and we can share also uh, this talk with other students, just letting you know that this will be shared with other parties. All right. So again, thanks for coming, Thomas. That was an awesome Thanks talk. for having me, okay? So yeah, I hope to see you in the conference okay? again. So take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. See you. Thanks bye -bye. for coming.